live from Mission. Tonight, alarm bells should be ringing as number of suicides steeply rise in the country. According to the latest data, close to 500 people have died by suicide in the last three months in what experts attribute to tough economic times and a tirade of failed relationships. The DCI says the country has never recorded such alarming figures in the history of this country, even as the larger conversation on mental well-being of Kenyans is still not a mainstay. According to recommendations made by the Mental Health Task Force, the government has been advised to declare mental illness a national emergency of epidemic proportions. This has not been done yet. And key questions on mental illness continue to be ignored at best and criminalized at worst. And so tonight, we ask, with all due respect, is it time we talk openly and freely about mental illness and start clawing back on the monster of stigma? We'll do exactly that tonight on With All Due Respect, WDR is the hashtag. We want to hear the stories of some personalities who are being brave to come to national television to talk about their own personal journey with mental health and illness. We'll hear testimonials from renowned record label CEO Ted Josiah and Nation FM's head of radio, Mark Bull Mohammed. Later, we'll invite analysis of the state of mental health in the country from Dr. Chitai Burabula, who's with me in the studio, who's the president of Kenya Psychiatric Association. Also, nominated Senator Sylvia Kasanga and Lois Mashira, health advocate. All right, let's now talk about mental health and why it matters to have a conversation around it. Let's uh, get some context with some data. Now, 450 million people worldwide are living with a mental illness. Now, this is according to the World Health Organization, which also says one in four of us Kenyans will experience a mental or neurological disorder at some point in our lifetime. So where does our country stand when it comes to the state of mental health? Well, the WHO has placed Kenya as the country with the fourth highest number of depressed people in Africa and ninth globally. Now, in numbers, 1.9 million people are depressed, which, by the way, is the most common mental health disorder and the leading cause of disability around the world. Now, with that in mind, here's a further picture of the struggle. Only 13% of health facilities in the country offer any service for mental health patients, and only 11% of the facilities offer treatment for psychosis and depression. Let's build the mental picture even further. Now, five in every six Kenyans who suffer from mental illness do not receive treatment. One of the ripple effects is suicide. Now, four out of five Kenyans who take their own lives are depressed at the time of death. And that, listen to this, men are two times more likely to commit suicide than women. Let's break down that number a little more. Now, mental health experts say Half of the people that go to hospital have depression. And 50% of patients in general wards in any hospital are depressed. 60% of people in a cancer ward are depressed. The reality is there are only 100 psychiatrists in Kenya and less than 500 psychiatric nurses, all to serve the 47 million Kenyans, not to mention the foreigners in our borders. Right, and once again, here's my panel. Testimonials from record label CEO Ted Josiah and Nation FM's head of radio, Makbul Mohammed. They're joining us uh, via Zoom. In studio with me is uh, Dr. Chitai Murabula, who's president of Kenya Psychiatric Association. And also in studio with me is Senator Sylvia Kasanga and Lois Mishira, who's mental health advocate, also joins us. That's my panel tonight, the best panel that we could ever have to talk about mental health. So let's start where we should. Good evening, Ted. Hi. Great, Ted. How are you? Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Here's the thing, uh, and, and thank you very much for coming on. Proud of what you are doing tonight. Here's the biggest problem with the mental health question is we know the data, we see the figures, but hardly we don't hear the personal stories. And you're here tonight. Uh, I'm here because um, a lot of people are afraid of uh, talking about their personal stories. Uh, people who go through depression and people who go through mental health 
uh, disabilities, I, 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 I prefer to use that word disability, is uh, they, they fear the stigmatization of what it could mean if they come out. And there's nothing wrong with saying that, hey, I'm going through these challenges and um, I need people to help me figure stuff out and I need to figure my own road and my own path out. I, I realized that I was going through this um, after the loss of my late wife. Um, when she passed, it life became very challenging for me. Um, locking yourself in a dark, in, in your bedroom um, from eight in the morning to seven in the evening and switching your devices off, um, for me, that that I realized something was wrong. You know, after three months of doing that, I realized um, I'm going on a downward spiral, and I need to actually um, claw my way out of this um, because I had a three-month-old um, child looking up to me, and I thank God that that child was there because she literally became the beacon of hope in my life and um, the the guide and direction that I needed. That that reason, you know, sometimes you just need one reason to get your head out of there. And a lot of people don't have reasons to get them themselves out of there. A lot of people find themselves in a situation where everything around them feels like a challenge. Uh, Ted, Ted, the, thank you for sharing that. The, the thing about uh, what you've spoken about is it happens in very individual spaces and it happens yes. alone. And from your own just experience as what you share, what exactly would you say was the thing that made you see, perhaps I can walk out of this, and this is the best way to walk out of it? What are some, where, where were your friends? Where is family in all this? Um, family and friends actually don't take depression seriously. They think uh, you're just having a bad day and you they buy you a drink and um, once you have a drink, you'll you know, um, get out of it. Um, here's a drink, here's a hug on, on, on the shoulder or a tap on the shoulder, buddy, go back to work, you know, and they throw you back into um, the whirlwind called life. Um, so people didn't really take it seriously that I was going through this. And they thought, ah, you seem on the outside to have it all going so well. Um, you're raising your child, you're doing your thing, and um, life is going on quite uh, hunky-dory. Yet deep down inside, I knew that I was facing a very dark time. How I managed to claw my way out of it, um, I think is a miracle one, because um, I, I didn't get the chance to see any um, psychiatrists. I looked at my child and I thought to myself, if I lose my mind, this child has nobody. So I better get myself out of this situation and, and, and make sure that I am focused enough to raise this child and just to love on her because she could feel the vibe you know um, um, um children feel the vibe if you're depressed if you're going through something they're going to feel that vibe and they're going to pick up on it and i had to really really will myself out of this so for me it was sheer willpower let me get myself out of this hole and let me focus on raising a child but the spin-off then became i focused on the bad company that i now work on and i put my energy in there and in so putting my energy, what happened was this pent up energy that was building up into depression um, had an outlet. And that outlet was my creative. Um, I'm a creative, so I like to do stuff with my hands. I like to create. And as soon as I got that outlet, I started to realize that I was unpacking and unboxing a lot of my emotions through the work I was doing. Ted, Ted final question for you. Uh, here's the thing. You're a known personality, celebrity. You create things. Ted Josiah is a big name, it's known. You're also a man. It's not easy to come out and say these things. Um, it, isn't hard. It, 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 it isn't hard for me because um, truth is, uh, it's about time that men started speaking up that they're having problems. Um, I've had a lot of friends. From the time I was 15, um, I remember uh, I was in third form when I first heard of the news of suicide. And the guy who used to sit next to me had committed suicide because of depression at 15. Men and boys go through a lot of uh, peer pressure and life challenges, and they don't want to speak up. Um, you said uh, men are twice more prone to suicide because we bottle things up. You can't bottle things up. You must have a person or people or a surrounding people to talk to so that you unpack these emotions because sometimes they're just ghosts in the dark and as soon as you speak to people you realize 
I'm stressed over nothing. So let me just move on with life. And sometimes you realize, actually, maybe I'm stressed over something because you've talked to somebody and they've told you, how about looking at it from this particular angle? And I decided today, hey, it's better I come out and just say, guys, look, speak up, reach out to people, talk, be emotional beings. Men have been taught not to be emotional beings, especially African men, and they bottle things up and end up um, either on the bottle or in, in, in really tough, dark situations, hiding from their emotions. Yeah. There's no need to hide from your emotions, man. Ted, just a record label CEO, entrepreneur, thank you very much for being brave tonight and thank you very much for sharing with us your story. We appreciate that. You're welcome. Let, let me get Makbul, uh, Mohammed Makbul, who's the head of Radio Cat Nation. Makbul, good evening. Um, You've heard what Ted say. What's, what's your story, Makbul? Actually, more or less on uh, what Ted was saying, I do apologize if there's a bit of an echo, but just uh, my sentiments on, on uh, Ted. The other day, Ted said something on Instagram that really uh, just says exactly what uh, myself as a man and a lot of uh, Kenyan men are going through at the moment. And he said, if you allow me to read, uh, so are we ready to speak about mental health? Are we ready to speak about depression? Are we ready to speak about the things that death of your wife can do to you, ment uh, to you mentally. Are we ready to speak uh, about how losing a job can mess your brain? Are we ready to speak on how being kicked out of your house can drive you mad? Are we ready to talk about uh, how not being able to afford food for your kids can drive you mad? These are things that are actually going on in society at the moment. But how we are wired, as uh, Ted said, as, as especially African men, is we are designed uh, not to uh, be human beings, not to feel, not to talk about our emotions, and always seek perfection. Perfection from uh, your beliefs, from uh, you maybe the church, maybe the mosque, maybe your family. Tradition dictates that you need to be in a certain way. Society dictates you be in a certain way. And there's always a sense of seeking something that um, you're not really uh, you know, going to be perfect, uh, so to speak. So a lot of these things, uh, childhood traumas that you haven't dealt with, and I for myself went through more or less the same thing, being part of a society which, uh, when you're in a limelight, you belong to the society, the expectations that uh, uh, are there that you need to meet. But at the same time, you're someone who goes uh, through a lot of uh, emotions that you can't talk about. And then when you find yourself in a space where you have your own family, you have work, you have a space where you hang out with your friends and all those spaces are not comfortable, it can uh, it can get really, really dark, I should say. Makbul, this, uh, I just I was heard from Ted, it's, it's, it's easy and also not easy. There's the question of stigma. Um, when, when, what's your story? When, when did it start? When did you realize, you know, you're really going into dark places and how did you realize and what made you sort of come out of it and where are you, where are you right currently? I got into uh, the entertainment scene at a very early age and I got really excited to meet a lot of different people who I really looked up to. Uh, but at the same time, I was coming from a background where it was very conservative, very religious, and then here I am in a world thrown where, you know, uh, I'm meeting the tenuous size of this world, I'm meeting uh, the, the namelessness of this world, people who have been in Chibigados. And, and being in that space at an early age and, and having a responsibility uh, to carry to carry uh, certain brands at an early age wasn't quite easy. And as well, dealing with the fact that uh, um, I lost uh, my brother in 2009 and my father in 2012, and never dealing with those things and never having discussions, especially with, uh, with my father, about a lot of things that uh, had gone on and we didn't really talk because in an African society it's designed that you wouldn't sit down with your father and actually have uh, a one-on-one -on -one where you can open up about uh, you know some of the things that you've gone through or some of the things that you've put each other through and all those things piled up and as Ted said you, you don't really talk about it you don't share we're not allowed to share because if you do you're you're deemed weak if you say you're depressed, you you seem like you 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 know you're being lazy and giving excuses. So there's a lot of a stigma that went on, and I, I self imploded, and it wasn't it wasn't a pretty sight. And like uh, a lot of people are saying, sometimes all you need 
is just uh, someone to talk to and open up and just have that overflowing emotion. And that is the first thing we need to start. Michael, what, what, what would you advise? What, what would you advise men as you know as a final thought? What do you advise uh, men and you know? especially men who are dealing with these things and who are watching you tonight who have followed you and followed your work and don't believe that, you know, you, you, you should be able to share these things because, quote-unquote, you appear weak. Society tells us you should be weak when you share these things. What did you tell men from your experience? Before, before you, you carry all these brands, as a, as a, especially as a Kenyan man, who I, I'm, a, I'm a Kenyan man I'm, I'm from this particular tribe. I, I go to church or I go to the mosque and there, there's so much expectation and, and it's totally unnecessary. As a human being, as a father, I've come to understand that what our children learn from us, it's not mostly what we, we tell them about history and all these things. It's mostly about who we are. And if we are not genuine enough, then what legacy are we, uh, are we telling our children? If I, I had to sit down and talk to my children and be open about where I am, and they understood, believe it or not, so, you know, anyone can do it and, and we should be open as men to sit down and talk and say, I'm having a bad day. Yeah. I, I'm having a bad day. I can't cope and I don't know what to do. Yeah. Not knowing what to do doesn't mean, you know, uh, that, that you're lagging in life or you're not achieving anything in life. It just means that that particular day you're not 100%. And stop this nonsense of, of achieving perfection in society because no one really is perfect. Yeah, right. Makbul Mohammed, uh, you're being very brave tonight, and thank you very much for bringing these, those perspectives. Makbul Mohammed is the head of radio here at Nation Media Group. I'll see you when I see you. We're taking a short break. When we come back, we'll be dis discussing now the state of mental health and mental illness in this country. Don't go too far. For an exclusive fragrance experience, try Nivea Men Deep Impact Body Lotion with a long-lasting woody fragrance, deep moisture, and a fresh skin feel. Make an impact with Nivea Men Deep Impact. Nivea Men, it starts with you. Narisha na Optiven. It's just about the right time to build your dream home. At the Garden of Joy by Optiven. It comes with Maram Roads, Solar Street Lights, water piping along the mains, and tree planting is done. Deposit 995,000 Kenya shillings and get a free washing machine for your home. Call us today on 0790 300 300. Be sure, check out for a KDIC sticker in your banking hall. KDIC, protecting your deposits. Just one capful of Dettol is enough to disinfect surfaces and protect your family and your home. Dettol, tested effective against COVID-19. about Molfix. Actually, another brand is recommended to me, but it had a leakage problem. Then I decided to try Molfix. His clothes don't get wet anymore. Because Molfix provides extra protection against leakage thanks to its anti-leakage elastic barriers. All babies deserve a high-quality diaper. You should also try Molfix.
the first sign of pain, you need a solution that you can trust. Try Panadol Advance. With Panadol's Optizod formula, the tablet absorbs quickly and starts providing fast and effective pain relief you can trust. Try Panadol Advance. Did you know at Riru Mabati Factory, you can open an account and leap a pole pole at your convenience? Did you know at Rui Rumabati Factory, you can get customized sizes according to your roof plan to avoid wastage? Did you know Rui Rumabati Factory offers free delivery countrywide within 72 hours? Call us now on 0111-050-700. Rui Rumabati Factory. Malisafi kwa beipoa. Welcome back. With all due respect, WADR, hashtag WADR on Twitter. That's where we're finding all your comments and your questions. And so what's the state, what's the exact state of mental health and mental illness in this country? We've seen the data, we've seen the figures, we've had testimonials, but what exactly is the state of mental in this country? Dr. Ali, would you want to start us off? Yep. <clears throat> uh, first, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting us to this show. And uh, I'm very grateful to the gentleman, the true gentleman, Ted Josiah, and uh, Mark Bull for sharing, you know, their stories. And um, for, by them doing that, they are actually helping to improve the state of mental health in the country in that uh, mental health is one of the most stigmatized subjects, uh, you know, both at the family level, at the individual level, at the societal level, all the way to the policy level. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the state of mental health in the country can be described as a state it, that uh, mental health can be described as a sector in the country that has been neglected for many, many years, many years of underinvestment, uh, many years of, of uh, you know, of, 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 of an availability of services. You know, the only hospital has been Madare for the longest time. And it's only in the recent years, uh, in 2019, where that conversation was, uh, you know, kicked off really at the highest level. Yeah. Uh, when that conversation about the state of mental health and, and the, you know, the president talking about uh, the state of depression in the country, mental health at the workplace, and the need to put in place, um, you know, structures to address the issues affecting mental health. And so uh, the truth is, in Kenya, I will say the, at least 5 million Kenyans suffer from mental illnesses. And, and, and we saw that uh, depression from the earlier statistics uh, affects about 1.9 million. I believe that that is a statistic that, uh, that, that is a pre-COVID statistic, I That's think from shocking. 2017. Yeah. So if you we are to talk about uh, the state of depression in the country right now, we are probably, probably uh, you know, we don't know, but yeah. probably it's, it may be above 2.5 million Kenyans yeah. because we all know what has happened between 2020 and now. Uh, and so, uh, but interestingly, you know, before COVID, we were having some conversation about mental health with regard to the task force. Yes. Uh, you, know, you know, the task force commission that was formed, the committee. And this committee began working in, uh, in, in December 2019, around December 2019, uh, you know, headed by Dr. Frank Jenga. They went around the country collecting views about what Kenyans thought about, about their mental health. Yeah. And, and towards the end of their work, uh, we had COVID striking. But they actually made very good recommendations, which despite the COVID, if that to be implemented, they will actually help. Yeah, yeah, we, we will. It will help yeah. improve and, 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 and the state of mental health of, of, of Kenyans. And so, if I look at some of the things that uh, this task force on mental health, you know, uh, proposed, is that let us declare mental health a national emergency mm -hmm. of monumental proportions. Of course, the reason for that is that we need attention. You know, we need more. We need to give it more attention. It has been neglected. It needs some bit of affirmative action. So declare that, and then let us have a body that whose work and mandate is mental health. So a, a permanent mental. commission yes. that just deals with mental health. Uh, you know, moving forward, and and they talked about many reforms on the law, the mental health uh, law to, to reform it, so that we have a structure. You know, we have a structure both at the national level and at the county levels. And, 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 and they talked about laws that need to be reviewed, um, uh, such as uh, uh, the uh, uh, suicide attempt uh, dec uh, decriminalization. Yes. 
It's a 1960. It's, it's an old law, yeah. you know, that uh, that states that if you attempt a suicide, and of course if you attempt, you've survived, then you should be taken to prison for one year or you, or, or be fined. Yeah. So it's a very old law. It's discriminatory. It's Penal Code 226. And um, at all levels, the law is very much behind the science. It's behind the constitution, that Penal Code uh, statute. And many countries have now decriminalized suicide to allow for the treatment of persons with, the, with mental disorders. If you look at um, the happiest country in the world, which is Finland, they decriminalized suicide in 1910. Uh, and, and many of these countries, like Denmark, so something and, doing right. and England, and, yeah. and they de decriminalized suicide a long time ago, but you are hanging on, on to an old law that makes it difficult even for a healthcare worker. So if you are a doctor in a hospital and someone comes who has survived uh, poisoning, you know, how are you going to attend to them yeah. when the law says that this person has committed an offense? You know, it you almost become an accomplice to yes. a crime. Yes. Uh, yeah, yet our health <clears throat> workers really do try to, uh, to, 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 to give help. So such laws, they need to be reformed. And, and the task force also spoke about the need to uh, reform NHIF. You know, uh, National Hospital Insurance Fund. Often you find that this NH our NHIF, uh, uh, you know, in as much as it has very good, you know, uh, you know, objectives, but when it comes to mental health, a lot of times there's some discrimination, a lot of discrimination actually, yeah. um, where they don't fully cover mental health problems. Um, yet, as we know, Kenyans cannot afford, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, healthcare out of pocket. Yeah. And lastly, they talked about restructuring of Madare Hospital, and I think that's an important point. Because uh, Madare Hospital has come to be the symbol of mental health in Kenya, and, and, and almost almost the the, the, the the icebreaker, you know, for jokes. If you want to make some joke, you start with Madare Hospital, yeah. and, and 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 talk about the state of the hospital. <clears throat> it's been deplorable for many years. Right. So, by suggesting a restructuring of, of that hospital, I think I think that that's a very good proposition, and 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 and, and also talking about. There are being some regional centers of, Where this uh, can of, of excellence. I want to come to those. Yeah, and so, on. Yeah. so those are some of the recommendations, and um, yeah. And, and, yeah. I want to come to this, uh, but I want to go to, to Lois first. Lois, as uh, a mental health advocate, before we go to the policy question, um, where, where do you say is the questions or two, three things that pinch the most when you talk about mental health or mental illness? Sorry about that. Thank you so much for having me on this panel and just, a, you know, a thumbs up for just putting this out here on this kind of level. So the three things for me that come to mind are one, um, the fact that mental health is not the same as mental illness. So just to start off this conversation, it's important to differentiate the two. Mental health is about the well-being of your mental state. So what are you doing to, you know, to, 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 to make yourself happy, to be at peace, to manage stress? Mental illness is something that's very different from mental health, although when you don't manage your mental health well, it could lead to mental illness. So in terms of the three issues that come to mind as part of these two um, topics, mental health and mental illness, is the fact that our current legal system actually doesn't recognize um, people with mental illnesses as equal rights holders. And so the issue of legal capacity is not, it's non-existent in our current law. The conversation of involuntary admission and basically forced admission is something that's, that's, uh, that's applied very lightly and we don't take deliberate steps to actually look at how best we can intervene when service users of mental health facilities are unwell and do need the treatment. And the third, the third thing is also, of course, the decriminalization of suicide. Um, as Dr. Tari has said, uh, yeah, the penal code does state that attempting to commit suicide is actually a misdemeanor. And when you do attempt to commit suicide, you're supposed to be reported to the police station. And that's an issue that, we, we, you know, as part of the mental health movement, we're trying to deal with that law because, as you also correctly said, a lot of our laws are borrowed from England, and England actually decriminalized suicide in 1958. So whereas we are applying a law that was borrowed from another country, we're not also progressing with doing enough research to see how best we can actually improve our laws and also just learn from best practices of other countries. And then also just to add on the fourth thing, on the fourth thing as well, when we talk about mental health, 
this entire discussion is great, but we also need to place enough emphasis on how to bolster our mental health to prevent us from getting to a point where there's need for an intervention. And I'm really happy with um, the testimonials given earlier because those are real issues. They didn't say they have mental illnesses. When they talked about depression, when they talked about not being able to contribute to society, um, when Ted talked about locking himself in a room um, from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m., you can easily see that you're not able to live your life. And luckily for him, he was actually able to look at his daughter and find motivation to actually pick himself up through that. But on the flip side, you also have people who just don't have that capacity to be able to do that. So then how do you address that? And in forms of treatment, how do the medical practitioners actually manage um, service users? So quality of treatment is also an important conversation, not just quality of treatment, but also dignified treatment. Right. Uh, Senator, when, when, when I, my motivation of having you on, on, on this platform today and the panel was that you have been an ardent and you've completely followed through on this question of mental health, you know, in your own capacity as uh, not just a senator, but as a person. Why is this important for you? Um, <clears throat> why is it important for me? It's because I've come to learn that um, there's no health without mental health. That's a hashtag I've been using, <clears throat> sorry, throughout the, the whole campaign since we started in 2018, when I was educated and, on what is mental wellness. And true enough, a lot of us don't understand what is mental wellness, what is mental health, what is mental illness. And um, when it was brought to my table as a question of concern, and I was given a crash course on this by one Dr. Kitazi back in 2018, then I learned that this is something that all Kenyans must know and must understand. It's something that we must have on our fingertips. And this is how we're going to fight the stigma, by understanding what is mental wellness, what is mental illness, and understanding that it is just a sickness. It can be treated. You don't need to isolate people. You don't need to hide. You don't need not to be able to come out and say, today I'm not feeling like myself and I need to find some help. Like what uh, Josiah, Macbo, Lois, they're saying. You know, they're saying we should learn how to make this as part of our lifestyle. The same way when you have a toothache, you will just say, I have a toothache, I'm going to see a, a dentist. Is the same way we should talk easily about mental wellness and about mental illness. So that is why I'm so passionate about it. And also coming to learn that even I myself have been mentally ill once in a while. I have yeah. been depressed, yeah. not once, not twice. <clears throat> But somehow, because maybe I have a support system that can get me out of bed, come into my room and open the curtains and say, get up, get up, and you know, you get yourself up again. Maybe I have that support system. Some others don't have, but there are other ways that you know you can spring back into yourself and go back to your purpose. So yeah. I've come to learn a lot in the process of this advocacy work. The question is this, that we, we, we've spoken about this, and there's a task force, and there's recommendations, as Dr. Ari has articulated. There doesn't seem to be urgency. No urgency to, to implement this, urgency to make sure that we know the numbers, we know the statistics, we know it doesn't look great. But where's the bottleneck? Oh, wow. <laughs> All right, first let me take you back a little bit. Yeah? Even before the Mental Health Task Force was formed, there was a lot of work happening in the background because once this was brought to my attention in 2018, we published the Mental Health Amendment Bill because we realized there's a very big legislative gap when it comes to mental health. I mean, there was a bill that is as old as 1989, slightly amended in the early 90s, but never brought up to the current dispensation. Yeah. Big mistake. We are already health is a devolved function. We should be talking about counties, you know, handling a big portion of mental health. So then the legislative process started in 2019. Actually, that is what happened. And in fact, in 2019, I think the bill had even passed Senate by the time the task force was formed. So you can see already members of the Senate were already seized of this issue. We debated it in Parliament significantly. In fact, it was one of the longest debated bills in the House at that time, which was passed unanimously and then handed over, of course, to the National Assembly, where it went and it was deemed a money bill. There's a big brother, you know, there's a big brother battle between Parliament and National Assembly, which was finally resolved by, by the High Court when they gave a ruling on what is and what is not a money bill. And therefore, the bill now was brought back again to Senate afresh, unfortunately. So you can see again how slowly certain reforms happen. Yeah. And, you know, that is one of the, um, the mental health task force did recommend that they need this legislation, that it should be passed, because then it brings the structure, the legislative structure that is required, mm -hmm. uh, especially now that we are pushing for budgets 
to go into into the into you know into the national budget we should recognize mental health so I, I will not say that the agency is not there actually you'll be surprised the agency is there the government is feeling it and I know because I'm always having conversations with them and I carry some of these documents with me you know this is the task force report which was a very comprehensive report in fact this one we have to really commend yeah the team that did it <laughs> but over and above that there's an action plan there's a mental health action plan that was launched just the other day just I wanna, to show I wanna, you there's I, something going on. I want to push you back on, on this in a, in a second. Okay. Let's take a break. But, <laughs> Dr. Ai, there's, there's, there's a difference between what we do very well in this country, and I recognize it everywhere because I see it here, and government that talks very well and government that does not implement things. Do you feel the same? Do you feel there's urgency in us solving the questions of mental health and putting the necessary required sort of guardrails to help all of us? Yeah, um, I mean that's the, that that that's a big problem, and um, uh, you know, but 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 since uh, you know th this uh, uh, mental health task force report was launched uh, sometime uh, last year, July, there have been a few steps that uh, we can identify with, you know, steps towards the uh, restructuring of the Madare Hospital, um, steps towards uh, having a, we have a presidential advisor, and then the action plan to implement the mental health task force report. Those are positive steps. Uh, you also, you see it. Yeah, yeah. You, you, those are positive steps. Of course, the gap. W w what is the gap? Uh, there the are serious gaps. One of the problems is that towards the, the, the end of this work of task force, task force, that's when COVID came in. So we have new challenges that have emerged due to COVID. And, right. and, and, and there's a whole problem of COVID-19 and mental health. Uh, are, we, uh, are we actively uh, trying to identify and even, even get information about what extent has COVID-19 affected the mental health of Kenyans? You know, Dr. Terry, I wanted to hang to that thought because yeah. that is exactly what I want to come back on the break, to talk yeah. about COVID-19 and mental health, mental wellness, and mental illness. And what has it done to all of us? Have we even stopped to think, with all due respect? tano ya watoto nchini Kenya wana ufupi wa kupindukia na mmoja kati ya wanawake wanne Kenya ana tatizo la upungufu wa damu mwilini dawa mjarabu kwa matatizo hayo ni vyakula vilivyorutubishwa zaidi maarufu kama fortified foods vyakula vya aina hii huwa na madini mengi na gharama yake ni nafuu kumbuka vitamini A inasaidia kuongeza nguvu ya macho na madini ya zinc yanasaidia kuimarisha kinga ya mwili Iweke familia yako salama na yenye afya kwa kutumia vyakula vilivyorutubishwa zaidi. Ujumbe huu umeletwa kwako na Wizara ya Afya, Chuo Kikuu cha JKUAT na Jumuiya ya Umoja wa Ulaya EU. Kwa machine yangu naitwa Eric, kama unaweza nita mgaka. Mimi ni Socha. Kasi yangu e, ni kuchunga mali ya wenyewe. Hakuna kitu ukua uchungu sana. Kama mtu kupotesa, especially pesa, ameweka kwa nyumba ama ofisini. Na hizo kesi ukua ngumu sana kufuatiriwa na waomba wenzangu, eh? Kama vile mimi ufanya, weka pesa yako kwa panga account juu KDIC imekuhakikishia iko safe, weka kitu kwa panga. Be sure check out for a KDIC sticker in your banking hall. KDIC protecting your deposits. For a better tomorrow, don't forget to do the 1, 2, 3 with Colgate every night. With the Stay Soft Refill, saving money is as easy as snip, pour, mix with water and shake. Stay Soft Refill. It's 2 liters of Stay Soft for up to 30% less. Inani 
At the first sign of pain, you need a solution that you can trust to provide effective relief and is gentle on the stomach. Try Panadol Advance for relief from headaches, body aches, and fever. With Panadol's Optizob formula, the tablet gently breaks down in the stomach, quickly absorbs, and starts providing pain relief in 15 minutes. For fast and effective pain relief that you can trust, try Panadol Advance. This has been Medifax for Panadol. Who wants to answer? Mary? Mary has a toothache. Oh, I see. And who knows why? Because her tooth is too big. No, it might be a hole in her tooth called a cavity. That's why I brush twice a day using Colgate. Imagine this is your tooth and these are food acids that cause cavities. Colgate with calcium and fluoride helps prevent cavities. Who protects our teeth? Colgate! For maximum cavity protection. We are Team Kenya. You win, we win. So buy any Tusker. Take your marks. Check it in your pekele. Get set. To my code to 29844. And win up to 80 million shillings in prizes. Cash, Team Kenya replica jerseys, and our sports shoes. Amazing Kenyan holidays. You can also leave a message of support for Team Kenya. When you win, we win. We are Team Kenya. Kenya Milele. Excessive alcohol consumption is harmful to your health. Not for sale to persons under the age of 18 years. Welcome back. Now, with all due respect, as is our fashion, as Kenyans, we've sort of smoothed past COVID-19. We've not spoken about what happened then, how it was impossible for all of us, our countrymen and women, how businesses collapsed, how we lost jobs. We've not discussed any of these things, right? But that has a direct impact in our collective mental wellness as a country. Let's start with you, Lois. Uh, your personal reflections of COVID-19 and how it's affected all of us. What would you say has happened and how has that affected us and what would you want us to do? All right, and as, 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 you, as you answer your question, uh, only Alvin Onjiri on, on Twitter says, we discuss our own issues while having drinks. The matter is left out to the empty bottles and glasses at the bar. So it's sort of like what we do as a country. It's like a national sport, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I mean, what he's saying on Twitter is so accurate. Um, I mean, COVID came and many people lost their jobs. I was one of the first people who, um, I was part of the group that lost my, I lost my job at the beginning of the pandemic. And it's true what you mentioned about job loss and being locked in the house and, you know, not being able to move around steps that normally we would take in the past to improve our, our well-being, like, you know, going to the gym or taking a walk or just social connections. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't see the value and acknowledge the importance of developing social connections. I mean, it's great that we can actually do this um, live, I mean, on, on virtual platforms, similar we're having this panel discussion, but it's not, it's, it's different from physical interactions and me, being able to comfort your friends and family if they're going through a difficult, if they're going through a difficult period. So I think in as much as we talk about normalizing mental health and not making and speaking more about it to avoid the stigma it's so important to to have the government and even Dr. here to really highlight steps we can take to improve our mental health because again when we talk about treatment and prevention of mental illnesses those are the steps we need to take in our lifestyle and one of the things that i'm very vocal about on my wellness blog tz talks is the fact that wellness is the active process of making deliberate steps every day to improve your health and health is both physical and mental health so collectively as a nation i think we have a domino effect if i'm not okay the people around me will sense that and that will be something that will have a domino effect in our communities right. and already for example one of the things that is of importance is the quality of treatment given to service users in mental health care facilities in the pandemic at the beginning of covid one of the things the Senate, the ad hoc Senate Health Committee did was actually to um, receive a member, memorandum which had details of how best to address mental health care during the pandemic. 
And for example, one thing that happened in China was that some of the patients actually um, contracted the illness within the facility and because they didn't they, they couldn't understand how to protect themselves or they couldn't they couldn't understand what basically applying COVID health guidelines is, then you found that a lot of people were getting infections. And so, you know, it's it's important to 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 acknowledge the health of Kenyans mentally, yeah. but also what is the quality of health being given to patients who are actually admitted in these facilities, especially a facility like Madare, for example. Right, right. right. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, same question uh, to you, Senator. And, and as you answer that, I also wanted to, to answer this question of what exactly would it change if a presidential declaration of mental, health, mental ill health as a national sort of emergency, what, what would change? Is it more funding? Is it just a nice thing for us to say mm -hmm. as you tell us exactly how the pandemic affected us? All right. So I was privileged um, to chair the ad hoc committee on COVID. So at that time, we were like on the forefront to hear what Kenyans were going through. And indeed, it was quite an impact. And it was an impact that was cross-cutting. And um, there was a newspaper article, I think yesterday, that was highlighting on the impact of COVID on adolescents now specifically. So now we are looking after COVID, or rather, it's still COVID. I mean, we are still, still in the era of COVID, but yeah. after the lockdowns of last year, what is the impact now? And one of the reports that is highlighting on uh, adolescents, you can see how seriously our adolescents were affected. In fact, it's a situation we're just discussing with Dr. Tari while we're seated there waiting, that we are very worried and we should be very concerned as a citizenry. If statistics show like 328,000 young girls got pregnant during the time of lockdowns, then we have a serious situation because you can imagine their mental you know, yeah, health well impact yes. and well-being. And that is just one section of the population that was affected. So you can cross-cut that to everyone else, including even the smaller babies who had to go through, you know, the trauma of what their parents were going through, right. you know, cascading in just the same way that Lois is saying. So definitely we have a situation at our hands as citizens. And um, when it comes to governance and leadership, there's a very big impact should the president pronounce this as a, you know, as, as, a, as a, an emergency, yes. as it has been. Because the minute he pronounces it, then there must be certain things that are done. He can't pronounce an emergency and then people keep quiet and sit down. And I think if at all there is any reason why he hasn't yet mentioned it, it's because they're busy putting the structures into place. And what I just wanted to say when you asked me a little earlier, you know, is, there, is it too slow? Or I think yeah. you were asking Dr. Tari, is the movement too slow? I would say you have to remember we are coming, how far we have come. Even by the time now we are talking about a mental health action plan that has come from a report. And I'm not saying this because I'm saying, yay, we've done well. No, 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 no. I'm just appreciating the fact that we've come from a place of we've come from somewhere. almost zero legislation. If we are talking about a 1989 legislation. We are talking about a situation where for the first time mental health has been discussed in parliament, you know, at that high level at a time when the president has appreciated that there's definitely a situation in one of his pronouncements before the task force was formed, and of course the formation of the task force and its recommendations, right. you know, those are steps forward. And I also want to tell you that, you know, there are counties that have gone ahead to make sure the services of mental wellness are brought closer to the people, as should be, as what is probably the, the mental health task force is recommending, as well as the bill that we have proposed, is saying, you know, health is a devolved function, and we have to see a large component of the access to services of mental health at the county level. And there are some counties that have actually gone ahead and made sure they have a battalion of, um, you know, community health workers on mental and health. Champions. Yes, and psychologists. Yes. I know Makuen in my county is actually having access to mental wellness. Mm. And the idea is even before we have a legislation or even as the government is getting their board ready and, you know, the action plans and everything ready, there are still things that the county governments can do because they do have budgets. Yes. So these are the things we are saying we want to see done even as we wait for other larger things to be done. For, for, for the national... Yeah. The, the, the yeah. question here is this, um, and everyone is asking, this country... Uh, something happened during the pandemic. There were massive layoffs. There was, you know, economic turmoil across for businesses. Uh, you know, these conditions that were there before that made, you know, the economy the way it is. But you're the, do you're the doctor here. Help us understand what really happened to the pandemic and how did that really affect generally all of us in our mental well-being as a nation? Yeah, um, I just have to say that, uh, that what I'll give is more of an opinion because we've not done a study. There's no study 
to show the extent which um, are, uh, our mental to, health yes. has been affected by yes, COVID-19. We're happy to take your opinion. But, but what we know is that uh, COVID-19 has affected, you know, COVID-19 itself can affect mental health directly or indirectly, only, and it has. So issues of, for example, anxiety, depression, and, and, and thinking about even people who went through, uh, uh, you know, uh, the illness, who are put in quarantines, who went to hospitals, who survived ICU, um, you later find that they suffer from problems of post-traumatic stress disorder. Others suffer from pretty serious mental illnesses uh, like psychosis, which can be really disabling uh, a condition. Yeah. So, so, so you find that uh, you know these are the things we are, we are, we are, people are dealing with, and the indirect ways in which also COVID nineteen has affected people's uh, you know health. And, and and this this would be things like um, the measures, for example. We have to talk about it. The measures. Uh, that were put in place anywhere yeah. in the world, not just Kenya, anywhere in the world where there were measures, there are measures that, that reduce people's freedom, uh, the, yeah. the ability to assemble and, and associate, congregate, to go to church, yes. go to sports, and so on. These things negatively affect our mental health. And, 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 and so even today, if you look at Kenyans, there is still that aspect of anger, there's frustration, there's a, some, even some element of defiance, you know, you know as a result of, of, of even the measures that were put in place. And even how the implementation was done from the uh, from the beginning, I think there were several problems. There were several missteps um, when you talk about the coercion, excessive force by the security uh, agencies. If you talk about the disruption of, uh, of, of, of of burial rituals for people, I think the, the, we did There's not think lot. deeply yeah. about 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 the, the measures we put in place. And, and I just hope that moving forward, uh, the, there'll be some effort towards building back the trust uh, of Kenyans uh, with regard to, because if we say that this uh, COVID-19 issue will be here with us for long, then we also have to think about how can Kenyans take responsibility for the, for, 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 for the, for the disease. Uh, you know, the, the government cannot police people's health, uh, you know, in their homes and, and everywhere they are. So, so the ultimate responsibility will come back to the individual and we have to invest more in educating the people. We have to invest more in, in, in vaccinations and, 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 you know, continuous education of people. But importantly also, we must do some research around to what extent has COVID-19 affected our mental health? Remember, before COVID-19, there were many Kenyans who were suffering from mental uh, illnesses of yeah. various kinds. Then COVID-19 came, and some of them relapsed back into their illness. Uh, some of them lost their jobs so they could not continue with, uh, with the treatment uh, and so on. So, and, and others developed new mental problems because of the COVID-19. So it's very important. Number two, it's important to have a mental health specific plan with regard to COVID-19. There has not been that plan. And that's a problem because at the community level, what happens? Nothing. You know, uh, you know in the villages, uh, you, you know, in formal know. settlements. So uh, professionals like myself and the Kenya Psychiatric Association has been proposing that, that coming back to train community uh, health volunteers in mental health to provide psychological first aid will be one of the uh, steps that can help. And, and also including uh, professionals in the in, in these aspects of uh, in the COVID-19 uh, um, you know response uh, team will also help in, in us uh, uh, you know taking into because we must at the end of the day account for for the mental health uh, you know effect of the COVID-19. But lastly, I also have to say that uh, coming back to the earlier question you asked about the implementation and and my worry will be at this point is if some of the positive steps we've taken we take steps back or they're not implemented, or there's no investment in it. Because the, the chronic problem of mental health in Kenya has been that mental health is allocated less than 0.5%. Continuously, consistently, if you look at the last 10 years, we, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a percentage of the health budget, mental health gets about less than 0.5%. In some cases, some years, 0.1%. Mm. When devolution came, you know, the ray of hope that this will improve in, 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 in the counties has become a false promise. We have not invested even at the county level in, in mental health. So we must be able to invest at the end of the day in All mental right. health because there are many benefits and there are many reasons why we must invest. And, and one most important one, which I'll just mention, is it's a human right, according to Article 43 it's of a the human Constitution. Right. Uh, I, 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 I want to go to Lois uh, as we wind down. Lois, as, as your final thought, uh, tell me the things that you want to see. As, as a mental health advocate, as a young person in this country, with the conditions that we're living in, with all due respect, 
what are those two, three things that you'd like to see? Sure. Um, with all due respect, I actually want to completely um, go the opposite direction from what my fellow, my fellow panelists have said. Um, we hear about the mental health amendment bill. We hear about recommendations submitted to the Senate Health Committee. We hear about the mental health action plan. And even Dr. Tari um, has correct, correctly noted that mental health is a human rights issue. And without health, without mental health, there's no health. But then at the same time, why should we spend so much efforts and so much resources on doing all these studies, whereas we already know the issue is there? I would rather we start with implementing what we need to implement, ensuring that the quality of treatment given to um, people who have mental health um, challenges, that they actually have access to this treatment, that they actually have access to quality treatment, that people are aware of actually where to go and get this support. Because if we talk about the impact of mental health um, as a nation because of COVID, I mean, I think it's also a bit of a redundant question because it has affected everybody. Mental health was an issue before COVID and COVID has only made it worse. So let's just start from the fact that mental health is something that's actually not being given enough priority and it's something that needs to be prioritized as soon as yesterday. So um, when Dr. Tari talks about psychological first aid, I'm intrigued by that because not now we're talking about this. So let's 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 be more practical with our solutions, thinking forward. Because at the end of the day, time the time we lose only makes it worse for people with mental health challenges to actually get the support they need. Atari, um, just one second. I'll come back to to you to you for your final thoughts. But here's the thing: um, why, why can't we prioritize what we have and, and we move forward? I know we have you know over shortage of professionals to deal with these questions. You'd know better than I do. Uh, why, why can't we just start, like Lois is suggesting, and move forward? Yeah, uh, uh, you know, uh, James, I, th I think we should not also think about uh, these proposals as happening sequentially. Some of them can happen at the same time. So uh, so why will we are uh, restructuring uh, our health uh, healthcare system, we can also be at the same time putting in place some preventive measures like mental health in schools, mental health in the workplace. But you cannot uh, downplay the importance of research uh, for us to be able to know. For example, I've said that uh, uh, investment in mental health has consistently been below 0.5%. Someone can ask you, what, will what, what then should be the investment? And the answer should be, it should be uh, consistent with the burden of the mental illnesses in the country. What is the burden of mental illnesses in the country? This information you cannot get just sitting somewhere in, in the office. Uh, you know, you need to, to go and actually do the study and, and establish. Right now, a lot of times we use figures from WHO, which are estimates, and that's a problem. So, so for example, right now, we would say that um, uh, the burden of mental disorders is 13%, meaning that the budget should be 13% allocated to mental health. But then we need to have we don't know. our local studies. Now, uh, the story you started with, about 483 cases uh, in three months, yeah, uh, yeah, or, you know, suicide deaths mm -hmm. in three months, 483. Do you know that in the previous year, you know, uh, the government announced that the annual suicide death uh, was was uh, 317, thereabout. Yeah. But now in three months, we, we, have, we, have, we are seeing a report of 483 cases. And these are those that are reported. What about those that are not reported? And it's only three months. So we, in a way, we are using faulty uh, statistics, and, and, and that can be costly. Okay. Yeah. For you, how, how should we look at this tonight as we end the show? Uh, it's a mixed bag, and I would really, really want to urge all of us as Kenyans to look at it a little wholesomely, uh, especially for Lois, for those of us who are out there and we are outspoken. There's something important about having the governance structures correct, and we should not downplay that. So that some of the strides that are being made are really key and they're important. Like what Dr. Tari is saying, it is critical that national budgets have to reflect the correct budgets for mental health because that goes largely into the infrastructure then that is required as well as the trainings that are required for the battalion of mental health practitioners that we are looking out for. But let's also appreciate what Luis is saying which is there are things that still can be done as we wait for those structures to be put into place. Again, we are all being called as Kenyans now to work together to support each other towards this. Right. So if you're out there, you know anything about mental health, this is the time. You come out, you speak about it. And then lastly, as Kenyans, as we ourselves, 
what uh, Ted and Makbu have said today, we have to embrace, you know, fungua roho. You know, they're saying open your heart. Fungua roho, let's talk about it. Come out and seek help. So as Kenyans as well, we have to come out. This is again, is helping each other. Yeah. And then we have to also reach out to our, you know, each other, to our neighbor, to your workmate, to your, to your colleagues, to your friends, to your family members. When you see somebody is a little bit down, you know, extend that hand and let's be kind. You know, let's extend kindness, I keep saying, towards each other because we are all in this boat together. If you're unwell, then everyone around you will not be well. So we have to well. really, yeah, we have to really work together in this right. mixed bag. Yeah. Okay. Actually, uh, 30 seconds for a professional view for everyone who's been watching this program tonight and they are not feeling well and, you know, they're in a place that they don't understand. That's your camera. What would you tell them? What, what should they do? Yeah. So what they should know is that um, uh, they're not the only ones suffering from mental uh, problems. Uh, a lot of us suffer from mental health challenges and, uh, and have suffered. And, and you can go through situations that make it difficult for you. What you should know is that, uh, you know, uh, find someone who, who, can, who can be able to help. But even if you're going through, a, a, you know, a very big loss, one of the things that can help you is simply just going back to your routine, the things you used to do, to do before, before the, the, you know, the event happened. But again, there are general principles that can, people can use simply to improve their mental health and prevent mental illnesses. This includes things like taking good care of your physical health. So everything that has been said before by health, health, health practitioners, things like exercise, uh, things like sleeping well, you know, a balanced diet, and so on are important. Secondly, it's important to stay connected to people. So stay connected to, you know, be it family and friends and make an investment in that connection uh, because it is extremely important for, you know, your mental health. And, um, uh, and, and uh, you know, and, and lastly, we can also talk about, um, uh, you know, uh, we can also talk about the importance of, um, of, of media in, in all this. And, and this is my last point that media plays a very crucial role uh, in mental health, educating the public. And that education of an individual helps them protect themselves. So when media, especially is covering uh, issues around suicide and homicide, let us be more sensitive. Uh, for example, you know, it, it will, the, in the, from the professional point of view, it would be inappropriate to use words like commit suicide and just say die by suicide and, and so on. But also when these stories come out, let us not put them as headlines. Uh, let us not um, uh, repeat uh, stories about suicide. Let us not give uh, over, uh, you know, Prominence. Yeah, yeah, too much detail about the method and so on because of copycats. And let us give advice of where people can get help. All right. Yeah. I want to go to three quick comments um, that have been made on Twitter before we leave. Um, and, and they should be on, on our screen right now. Um, but just before that, uh, your colleague, Dr. Steve Buire, says, guys, um, oh, the comments are here. Uh, BJ Mutuku says, let's make it a habit of checking in on each other, our families, our friends, colleagues, etc. Let's not assume people. We have exchanged people and relations for things. Um, that's BJ Mutuku on Twitter. Uh, Joy Wanja, uh, women are more likely to experience mental health conditions than men. Women are more likely to attempt suicide. However, men are more than 3.5 times more likely to die from suicide than women. Suicide methods are used are aggressive. We need to bring more men to the table and coping there, Dr. Lukoya Atwoli, who's been following our conversation. And the final one is, uh, do maybe says, I work in a refugee and former child soldier rehabilitation programs and mental health is a big issue, both to those we help and caregivers. They need to decompress after the session is equally important for caregivers, as lack of it usually leads to depression and isolation. Dr. Steve on Twitter says, guys, please prioritize your mental health seek help speak your heart out don't suffer in silence with all due respect that is the conversation we've had tonight and we commit on this program and on this channel to have this conversation as often as we can and bring a professional as often as we can but most importantly bring people who can speak about their own journey to help all of us to cross this stigma barrier lois mashira who's mental health advocate thank you very much for coming to the program you've done very well uh, dr Thank you very much uh, for showing up and, and your strong comments. And Senator, you've all done very well. Thank you very much for coming to the program. My name is James Smart. We'll do this all over again next week, next time on the same station.